Hello, welcome to CAT 109, the history, politics, and ethics of the cannabis industry. Today, we're going to be looking at a history of cannabis from the fall of Rome to the 1800s. So when we look, look at historical markers, the fall of Rome is one of those biggies in terms of major civilization shifting change. So in 476 CE, the Western Roman Empire, and that's important to note because there's also the Eastern Roman Empire centered around Constantinople and Turkey uh, that is still around. It's not around today, but it's still around in 476. So we're talking about the West. Fell to the Germanic tribal, tribes, the Goths, the Visigoths, the Franks. There's a whole bunch of uh, barbarian tribes who are making their way into southern Europe, into Italy, down through Italy, into Greece, etc. So this is when the era of the Dark Ages falls, because when Rome falls, you also see learning, the idea of writing things down, the idea of invention, the idea of of keeping track of things kind of also falls away because there's so few written records we don't really know what's going on. On the other hand, on the Eastern Roman Empire, things are going great there and I'll talk about that in a second, but it continued on until the 1400s. The Dark End Ages ended around 800 as Charlemagne emerged as a powerful and influential king who elevated the Catholic Church as the leading power for the next 600 years. In other words, he turned the Catholic Church into a political ally, imposing his ideas of what family life should be, what priests should do, etc keeping in mind that Charlemagne was a king who had lots and lots of concubines or girlfriends as we would say. Snacks on the side, that's the better option. The Eastern Roman Empire flourished meanwhile with great medical, mathematical, scientific studies being explored. So for this um, PowerPoint uh, video we're going to be talking a lot about the East um, and then we're going to loop back around to the West. So who actually invaded Rome? It was um, a variety of barbarians, but the Germanic peoples were by far and away the most dominant or prevalent. So pagans engaged in polytheistic nature worship, which essentially means that, you know, if the seas have a goddess or a god, the sky has a god, the tree has, you know, spiritual beings inside of it, there is an idea of that nature is alive in more than a biological sense. In the ancient Germanic paganism, cannabis was linked with the Norse love goddess Freya. And that's her on the right with the cat and the bird and the staff and, you know, the swaying um, plants behind her. The harvesting of the plant was connected with an erotic high festival held in her honor. So, you know, when you think of the goddess of love or um, somebody who is responsible for any kind of sexual in engagement, what you're really looking at is somebody who is responsible for birth and rebirth and how the earth as a um, natural being regenerates itself you know in the in the fall it dies off winter is dead spring we see rebirth so this is how the Germanic pagans interpreted um, this idea by putting it in the context of here's a goddess that we we have to worship for crops for our wives to have babies and for the world around us to flourish it was believed that Freya lived as a fertile power in the plants, thin flowers, i.e. that would be the cannabis where the THC is. And by consuming them, a person fell under the influence of this divine force. So if you are the kind of 
person who is looking to uh, have a baby or have lots of babies, you know, it is a great goddess to have as your resident goddess. In Norse mythology, Freya is the powerful goddess of love, lust, and beauty, but she is also the warrior goddess, and she symbolized wisdom. So she's pretty important because she's got a lot going on there. Freya is usually depicted with a sword or wand and or a staff in her hand while riding in a chariot pulled by cats. One of the things that I love is that she can get cats to pull her around, whereas the rest of us can't get our cat to get off our laptop. And she's often surrounded by those leafy green plants you saw in the previous picture. She was the most prominent Volva of all, and Volvas were oracles who could intercede on a person's behalf and use magic to help them. So in a nutshell, she was a magician. And in those days, what you saw the magicians doing is being able to control weather. So this all is very consistent with the anthropological writings of how cannabis would appeal to the people who worshipped Freya and who prayed to her and would use it as a sacrificial uh, plant for her. In 725 CE, the monk, the Venerable Bede, wrote that Easter takes its name from an Anglo-Saxon pagan goddess called Areste, or Ostara, or Ishtar. Take your pick. There was a whole bunch of pagan goddesses running around at this era, and all of their names were slightly different. Bede is considered a very reliable and valuable historical source because he traced the transition from paganism to Christianity among the Germanic and Anglo-Saxon tribes. So when we read something that the Venerable Bede wrote, we pretty much take it as fact because there's so much cross-referencing with other historians. Additionally, German ethnobotanist Christian Ratch, in his book Marijuana Medicine, and by the way, available on Amazon, wrote that Astara's spring worship ritual involved the sacrifice and feast of spring hares. There's those bunnies. We wash it down with some hemp beer, and then we have a good old-fashioned public orgy. Not surprisingly, the Catholic Church outlawed these and banned most of the pagan sacraments. But it was the hemp beer went, th went away because of the government. The government passed the Bavarian Purity Act of 1516. So we're in the Germany, Austria, Bavaria, that like little trifecta area in the middle of Europe. And so they got rid of it because they wanted to have their beer only made from hops and barley. So this law, I believe, still stands today. And as such, it's why, you know, German beer has such a reputation for its unique taste. Whereas, you know, you come to the United States and every craft brewery is putting all kinds of different cool things in their beers. So, one of the other groups that were running around at this time were the ancient Celts. And these are the folks that we associate most closely with the British Isles and Ireland. Um, but they actually started out in this German Germanic, Austria, Bavaria region which is today part of Austria and it is called Hallstatt. It is considered the birthplace of Celtic culture and it's because the evidence was dated to the time period we know that the Celts started to solidify and move across uh, Europe and into the uh, British Isles. So Figuring they were somewhere in the area of 70 or 80 BCE or eh, up to about 400 AD in this area. And what they did, they found these pipes that had hashish traces in them. And over there on the right hand side is some artwork from a Celtic archaeological dig. And you see the guy is holding what looks like a little pipe, so or a long pipe, kind of a hookah. 
Hashish is a concentrated resin, usually condensed into a solid. It is usually smoked in a pipe or mixed with flour in a joint, and it can be eaten as well. Hashish made from the resin is far more potent than marijuana, and it was used primarily around the Eastern Arabian countries at the turn of the millennia, so 1000 CE. In the 900 CE, an Arab physician, Ibn Washiya, called the odor of hashish deadly in his book on poisons. The fact that he called it deadly is not as important as the fact that, you know, it's being written about in um, references that doctors are writing down. So, just as a way of identifying the first time it appears in literature. I know, that's super exciting. Uh, so on the bottom left there is a little piece of hashish. You'll see I have a penny next to it. Well, I didn't put the penny there, but somebody did. Uh, to give you a reference size, it's a very compressed, it's like compressed wood almost. It's very brittle and um, very potent. And then in the Middle East, you will see lots of hookah bars where guys sit around having some hookah. And it could be tobacco or it could be a little bit of hashish mixed in. Now, going back to the east, we're going to go way back to the Persian founder of the religious order of Sufis. And this guy's name was Haydar, and he encountered hashish in 1155 of the Common Era. Haydar was an ascetic monk who lived in a monastery which he built in the mountains of Persia. Persia is now known as Iran but a lot of people still call themselves Persians because of the cultural ancestry. One day, Hadar left his monastery to wander the fields, and when he returned, his disciples noted he had been in a state of happiness that he was rarely in, to the point of allowing the disciples into his personal chambers. So Mr. Grumpy Pants suddenly became a nice guy. Hadar said that he consumed the leaves of the only plant that swayed in the oppressive heat. So a little lyrical poetry for you this morning or afternoon whenever you're listening to this. Um, but clearly you know this was something that really changed his perspective on the world. Hadar showed his disciples the plant under the condition that they never show anyone but the Sufis. The Sufis are a Muslim sect that um, were pretty much isolated because they were very poor, they did not seek out riches, and they've kind of, in in terms of um, a religious order, they're still around, um, and they are a religious minority that is often um, under attack by other sects within the Muslim um, pantheon, and, you know, they are a unique group. So, for the Sufis, Hashish was merely a means of stimulating mystical consciousness and appreciation of the nature of Allah. Keeping in mind again, the stimulating mystical consciousness and appreciation is really taking your current state of being and taking it to a euphoric level, which is what THC will do, and the CBD and everything else that's in the plant is also going to make your body relax and as a consequence you do feel like you have achieved a new level of being. Before his death in 1221 he asked that cannabis seeds be sown around his tomb so that his spirit might walk in the shade of the plant that had given him so much pleasure during his lifetime. Again, so poetic about um, this euphoric feeling and it's it's almost uh, like he's talking about love in a way. So we know that hashish was pretty well known in the Eastern uh, Arab countries. However, hashish wasn't very well known anywhere else until the middle of the 1200s thanks to one man, Ibn al-Baytar. Betar, a Muslim botanist, went on a pilgrimage through the Middle East and Egypt in which he recorded the use of hashish among all the other botanical information he collected. According to Ibn al-Betar, 
He noted that the Sufis, a religious group, had a special way of preparing their hashish, now keeping in mind that they're using it for a religious ritual that's uh, going to take them to the next spiritual plane. So first they baked the leaves until they were dry. So they're decarbing the, the, the leaves. Then they rubbed them together between their hands to form a paste, rolled it in a ball, and swallowed it like a pill. So that paste is all the resins coming out. Rolling it into the ball just gives it some substance to attach the resin to, and there you go, you've got yourself a nice little um, microdose. Others dried the leaves only slightly, toasted and husked them, mixed them with sesame and sugar, and chewed them like gum. So again, what we're seeing here is that this is a product that has been around for a very long time, not just from a medical perspective, but also from a spiritual perspective, because it does allow you to maybe push away some of the cares that you're dealing with and focus more on sensory experiences. So let's see what's going on back in Europe. In the Middle Ages are in full swing. So, and this is characterized by the all-encompassing authority of the Roman Catholic Church. Remember, Charlemagne made that deal and the Pope being as powerful as many of the kings. So, Charlemagne creating an alliance with the Catholic Church essentially elevated the Pope to king status. The Catholic Church was corrupted by its own absolute power and collaborated with the kings to ensure the status quo, enriching any everyone except the very devout poor. So it was really, if you watch something like Game of Thrones, it's exactly that way. And George R. R. Martin uses many of real life historical experiences in the show and he weaves it into his plot. So if you're a history buff and you haven't read the books, they're great that way in particular. Um, St. Hildegard of Bingen, 1098 to 1179, was a, women, a woman monk, and she wrote extensively on medical topics and recommended the use of hemp for a variety of ills in her book, The Physica. So hemp, or as they wrote in those days, hauf, is warm and grows where the air is neither very hot nor very cold. Its seed is sound, and it is healthy for healthy people to eat it. It is openly gentle and useful in their stomach, since it somewhat takes away the mucus. It is able to be digested easily. It diminishes the bad humors and makes the good humors strong. But nevertheless, whoever is weak in the head and has a vacant mind, if that person will have eaten hemp, it easily makes the person suffer pain somewhat in his or her head. And basically what she's saying is, if you've got a brain in your head, you'll be fine. And if you don't, it just makes you worse. However, whoever is sound in the head and has a full mind, it does not harm. Whoever is only moderately ill, it does not cause pain when eaten. Also, the cloth made from the hemp heals ulcers in weeping wounds because the heat in the hemp has been tempered. So, you know, what we're seeing here is a nun or a monk who, writing a medical reference book of the time, has a variety of advice to give about who should and shouldn't use hemp. So, remember how I said the Roman Empire caused a massive shift and change in society and civilization in 476. Well, almost a thousand years later, in the mid-1350s, the plague, the Black Plague, the Black Death, whatever you want to call it, arrived on European shores from Mongolia by way of Italy. Now, the reason that it was such a shifting, massive change is because one-third of the European population was wiped out in just about three years. That is one out of every three people dead in three years. Just think about that. It's staggering. While this was all going on, the Catholic Church 
was powerless to stop the plague, and people grew discontented with the church's helplessness and corruption. The church, realizing that it was not only losing its power, but being blamed for the plague, went on the attack. Much like what we see today, it's always going to attack the victim. So, the church targeted the so-called demons and witches for causing the widespread pandemic. Yes, that's right. The witches did it. So, whenever medieval artists depicted the witches' Sabbath, they depicted a group of women who were usually naked, compounding a mysterious drug in a large cauldron. Oh, look, naked ladies with a big cauldron. Yeah, it's pretty much a standard uh, trope or cliche of that era. As early as the 15th century, it was declared that witches used hemp for their ceremonies. And in 1484, Pope Innocent VIII issued a papal command condemning witchcraft and the use of hemp in the Satanic Mass. Now this is where we see hemp being curled around the idea of Satanism, of the Satanic experience, of the witch. And cannabis as a um, individual or unique plant isn't referenced. We're just looking at the word hemp, but we're going to assume that means all he cannabis um, products at this stage in the historical record. Nevertheless, I know witches did not listen to the uh, Pope. Uh, cannabis still retained its importance as a key ingredient in the magical potions well into the 19th century, well into the 1800s. So, you know, 400 years they didn't listen to the guy. In 1615, an Italian physician and demonologist, Giovanni di Nawa, and I'm sorry for my Italian, it's terrible, listed hemp as the main ingredient in the ointments and oils used by the devil's followers. So now again, we're beginning to see the tide turn against hemp because, again, they didn't realize that there was necessarily differences. You know, they grew a plant, some of it flowered, some of it was uh, stalks. This is Europe, we're not talking about the Middle East. And um, so they had a very rudimentary understanding of all of this. So hemp, along with opium, belladonna, henbane, and hemlock, the demonologists believed, were commonly resorted to during the witch's Sabbath. During the witch's Sabbath, these herbs induce the hunger, euphoria, intoxication, and sexual arousal responsible for the banquets, the dancing, and the orgies that characterized the celebration of the Black Mass. Um, over here on the right hand side is a copy of a book from 1643 about the um, case of a particular witch in Newbury. So I just like the title and give you an idea of the horror that people looked at witches with. So another massive change occurs in the 1600s. So this is the third massive historical point we're looking at in this lecture alone. This is amazing, right? From the 1600s through the end of the 1800s, the Portuguese, the Spanish, the Dutch, the British, and the French all developed colonies in other countries in order to reap the rewards of raw materials and cheap labor. For example, Great Britain had a little colony across the Atlantic Ocean that eventually broke away and we now know it as the USA. Woo -woo. Um, but Britain also colonized India, South Africa, the Bahamas, and many, many more. It was basically people showing up with guns and a flag and said, now you belong to us. And because we have guns and you don't, you don't get a choice in the matter. So by the dawn of the 20th century, the merchants, the missionaries, the soldiers, and the colonial administrators of developing countries were all from these home countries of England, Portugal, Spain, Holland, and France. Much like the USA, these colonies eventually broke away from their colonizers, but not until the 20th century. In the meantime, 
for many Europeans who traveled to these different countries. And that's really what this colonization also did, was it opened it up for people to go and visit because they felt safe, because the government was the same as the government they had at home. Um, it meant they were exposed to open cannabis use for the first time as well. So, you know, you're not really thinking of the family of four who go to Disney World today. I'm thinking more about these young uh, people in their 20s and 30s who are backpacking or traveling through these areas while they are in school or on a break from work scientists doctors researchers you know because we're also at this point seeing travel emerging as something people did to experience life garcia de orta 1501 to 1568 was a young doctor in portugal after hearing about India and curious about the strange drugs the people of India used, he enlisted in the civil service and was assigned to work for the Viceroy of India, the British leader in India. He recorded everything about India's pharmacologic substances. Da Orta wrote his famous colloquies on the simples and drugs of India, simples being syrups, which was subsequently published in 1563. The book was to become the most important text on natural medicines since Dioscorides' Herbal, previously the most influential text of its kind for the previous 1500 years in the West. And of course, Da Orta discusses Bang, a drug he describes that makes a man laugh foolishly and lifts him above all cares and anxieties. While having an aphrodisiac effect, it also helps people sleep. Now, sadly, Da Orta's writings were almost lost to history. And that's a shame, because when it was initially published, physicians began to look at cannabis differently. And they saw that if it was properly prepared, it could be used for a variety of issues. You, you know, if you need to sedate someone, stimulate an appetite, sexual arousal, and this is way before we had any of our erectile dysfunction drugs of today. So, you know, clearly this would have been something that would be very popular. Um, the reason that we almost never got to see this book is because the Catholic Church found out after he died that he was actually Jewish. He was a closet Jew who had hidden his religion nearly all his life. And this, of course, was a time when Jews were under um, great scrutiny um, because, and in a nutshell, this is what it boiled down to, the Catholic Church and Muslims do not believe in what's known as usury, which is a form of loaning money with interest. Um, which meant that the only people left were the Jews, and the Jews ran the bank. So, of course, they hated the bankers, and since all the bankers were Jewish. Now, obviously, this has changed today because the people who are running the banks tend to be white Anglo-Saxon men. Um, but, you know, some um, prejudice live on. Fortunately... A Flemish botanist discovered a copy of the book in a Lisbon bookshop, you know, kind of a used book, kept it from being destroyed by members of the church, and then later was able to have it republished in Latin, Italian, French, and English, and it became widely circulated. So, again, you know, it's this idea of institutions, large institutions that are stopping the flow of knowledge. So now we hit the 1500s. Hemp is very popular in Europe. Hemp-based medicines are now being understood and having some validity. So here are some titles of books that were published in the 1500s that were all based on hemp. So the first one is a most excellent and perfect homish or hashish apothecary or homely physic book for all of the griefs and diseases of the body. And that's 1561 by Harmonius Brunschwig. 
a very excellent and profitable book containing 604 score and odd experiences medicines appertaining unto physic and surgery and this is was written in uh, Italy in 1569 by Girolamo Rosselli approved medicines and cordial recipes with the nature's qualities and operations of sundry samples and a publication date of 1580 and there's a picture of the book on the right hand side and then a rich storehouse or treasury for the diseased wherein are many approved medicines for diverse and sundry diseases which have long been hidden and not come to light before this time so all of these books reference hemp in the treatments for a variety of these problems so in a sense what we're seeing is legitimization of hemp as a medical option Thomas Vickery published in his book the surgeons directory for young practitioners in anatomy wounds and cures etc shewing the excellency of diverse secrets belonging to that noble art and mystery and in this particular book in which was published in 1651 he recommended a hemp concoction for children's coughs and I love what it's called for a vehement cough in young children take the juice of parsley powder of comine women's milk that would be breast milk and mix them together then give the child to drink thereof and afterward take make this ointment take the feed of hemp or flax and fenicric don't know what that is and feed them into common water so you're basically adding them into water then pref out with your hands the fubtins of the herbs which you shall mingle with butter and anoint the child with as hot as it can be so basically what you're doing is you're decarbing the hemp in this concoction of uh, water and all these whatever fenicric might be and then you are going to take out the herbs and have the child um, or put the herbs in with butter and then you know basically apply that to the child this is a topical lotion that any medical marijuana or recreational marijuana place probably carries today it's not written in such a diversely entertaining um, recipe but nonetheless so again now we're seeing it being recommended for kids it really goes mainstream 1653 because the Royal College of Physicians of London published the pharmacopoeia Londonesius and within this book hemp is recommended for a variety of ills and recipes and various oils of recipes are included so here's one syrup of Agnes Castus and again here's another recipe if you're desiring to you know kind of explore your inner uh, 1600 person but the point is is that the uh, Royal College of Physicians of London these folks were the equivalent of like the American Medical Association today you couldn't get much more on the ball than this particular group by the 1700s cannabis is a common home remedy so outside of England hemp based medications were often used by country folk who didn't have access to doctors keeping in mind that hemp is fairly easy to grow and even if you're not getting a lot of THC you are getting the qualities that CBD brings to the table in Poland Russia and Lithuania peasant farmers relied on the vapor given off by smoldering hemp seeds to relieve their toothaches and other common folk uses for the plant were in easing childbirth reducing inflammation reducing fever and the swelling of joints preventing convulsions and curing jaundice and rheumatism so it's really a cure-all that um, by the 1700s was very popular and very prevalent across Europe now we get to Napoleon Napoleon tried to conquer the world and in 1798 he went and invaded and took over Egypt and while he was in Egypt the soldiers discovered that 
because it's a Muslim country, there wasn't a lot of alcohol to be had because Muslims are forbidden to drink alcohol. So they found out about this other intoxicant called hashish. So they would start to use this. Now remember, it's way more potent than marijuana, so it really does have a um, sensory experience that goes beyond just the average uh, th THC experience. And Napoleon was afraid that hashish and ultimately cannabis would impair his men, so he issued this order. It is forbidden in all of Egypt to certain to use certain Muslim beverages made with hashish or likewise to inhale the smoke from seeds of hashish. Habitual drinkers and smokers of this plant lose their reason and are victims of violent delirium, which is the lot of the to give themselves full to the excesses of all sorts. Despite this admonition, he had quantities of cannabis and hashish sent back to France to be studied by the medical researchers of the day for its pain relieving and sedative quality. So clearly the guy understood that even though it could turn his men into, you know, basically sitting on the couch eating Fritos, watching TV, if they had Fritos and TV back in those days. Um, but he also understood that there was a lot of medical possibilities. And cannabis would also be able, was found, treat tumors, cough, and jaundice. So the next uh, kind of evolution was the idea of recreational use in Europe. And this emerged through hashish clubs in France. Because remember, it was Napoleon's soldiers who went to Egypt and discovered the joys of hashish. So in addition, we have our French physicians and scientists who were also investigating the therapeutic potentials. So in 1847, keeping in mind this is almost 50 years after Napoleon, the Pharmaceutical Society of Paris posted a prize for isolating the active principle in cannabis. And this was eventually won in 1857 when THC was isolated. By the mid-1800s, hashish clubs had also sprung up around Paris, and these places were seen as exclusive clubs for the young and wealthy to experiment with smoking intoxicants. So if you think of who we see in gossip pages today, people like the Kardashian crew, ugh, um, Justin Bieber and Haley Baldwin, um, Kristen Stewart and Stella Maxwell, whoever is popular uh, and young and who go to clubs. This is what you did. And the French poet Charles Baudelaire visited one of these clubs a few times and wrote a poem called Poem of Hashish that was published in his book The Artificial Paradises. Baudelaire ended up not enjoying hashish or becoming a regular user because it made him feel too happy, since he preferred being despondent and depressed. And as funny as that may sound, you know, that was what he made his money on, being a depressed poet, so you could understand. As the hashish clubs gained popularity in London, young people and artists or I'm sorry, in Paris, young people and artists soon demanded an opportunity to experiment in England. However, after the British glitterati tried it, they realized that they preferred booze, alcoholic beverages. So hash did never caught on in England the way it did in France. Now, Dr. William Brooke O'Shaughnessy, a nice Irish boy from Limerick, served in India during the war, and in 1842 he introduced cannabis-based medications to Britain. It was recommended for individuals with rheumatism, menstrual cramps, muscle spasms, and insomnia. At this point, you should have noticed that the uses are all very similar from civilization to civilization, from culture to culture, because these are the things that people suffer from the most. Just kind of keep that in mind. Over here on the right is a picture of the book Charles Baudelaire eventually published. This is a modern version of it. 
Um, and just as a little P.S. on Ch Charles Baudelaire, in case you wondered if he ever found happiness, he died of a syphilitic, syphilitic infection in his brain. Um, basically, his brain turned to mush, so he was probably quite delighted with the way he died, being painful and miserable. So, here is Dr. William Brooke O'Shaughnessy. And when he returned to England in 1842, he brought back cannabis and asked the pharmacist, Peter Squire, to convert to a form appropriate for medical use. And this soon became known as Squire's Extract. As soon as Squire's Extract became commercially available, physicians started to prescribe it for almost any physical difficulty. And one of the earliest conditions for which it was administered was childbirth and menstrual cramps. You know, if you think about it, you know, women in general deal with this excruciating pain every month without having really much to help us. You know, the doctor might give us some extra strength, Advil or Motrin, but, you know, in a lot of ways, you need a anti-cramping or anti-spasm or spasmodic, and this certainly fits the bill. So, that's it for today. We're going to talk about um, the evolution of how it went from being a very popular medication in the 17 and 1800s to being outlawed in the 1900s. So, here is my page of citations. All of these are great resources. I highly recommend all of them. And if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, text or email me if you are not in my class but you have a question feel free also to go ahead and leave me a comment and I will respond as quickly as thank you and have a great day